the uh, wild geese who do not intend to cast their reflection and the water has no mind to receive their image. That was the first message I got from the first fortune cookie I opened when I returned from India. And it seems like a fitting contract for these meetings. And perhaps the full implications of that contract will become clear as the afternoon continues. to do is to present a model to you and the specific model is my own life experience and that's really all I have to offer to you on my own experience like to clarify the reason for doing this. It is not my expectation or my hope that any of you necessarily would undergo the particular journey that I am pursuing. I am not proselytizing for Ashtanga Yoga. We in the West are faced with a very interesting predicament <laughs> through a variety of circumstances, some of which are built into the culture like changes in communication media and so on. Some of them are the result of the chemicals that have appeared and been widely used, psychedelics. Some of them are personal experiences people have had which previously they kept hidden but now they begin to redefine or they've hidden them under labels the society provided them which made them seem like psychosis or insanity or and they now reconsider them as a result of all these circumstances many people in the West including me and I assume you and that must be what's bringing you here appreciate the possibility of states of consciousness other than our normal waking state of consciousness. Or maybe you're here just because you look at the world in which you're living and you say, well, we obviously can't handle it with what we've got going, so I'll at least look for something else, even though you may not have the faith and the possibility that there is something else, but you're going to look anyway. So we're presented with a possibility, and it filters through to us from one source or another that there is a very ancient tradition of people who have realized other states of consciousness and have sent messages and made maps. But the problem that we have as Westerners is that we can't understand the maps. The maps are there. The secrets are not secrets in the sense of, I'm not going to tell you. They're secrets of, they're secrets in the sense that we can't hear. Uh, Jung, in his um, His writings in the book by Wilhelm called The Secret of the Golden Flower. It's a eulogy to Wilhelm. 
he commends Wilhelm for having the courage as a Westerner to give up his predispositions of thought to be able to get into that position from which he could appreciate the Eastern writings from a from an inside point of view. In other words, give up his identity as a Westerner. The term that you may be familiar with that's required is what's called surrender. And so what we can do for one another as Westerners is collect the data that are available to each of us as we open ourselves to them. We are all on a journey. We are just as Herman Hesse talks about, the fellow travelers on our journey to the East. East not being literal necessarily, but metaphorical. And what we can do is we can help each other along. We can be the satsang, the sangha, the spiritual community, the support for one another, giving each other the confidence to keep pursuing this possibility. And we give each other our own lives to help, and that's what I would like to do today, is to present, as I say, the model because maybe there'll be some clues in it that will be of some use to you in your own sadhana, in your own spiritual journey. But in doing this, I am going to work on myself throughout this whole afternoon, as I'm always doing, doing my mantra. Japa, and therefore I'm really not speaking, <laughs> I should tell you, and I hope you aren't listening. Because the place where I am, and I hope you are, is the same place where we together are witnessing one of us speaking and the rest of us listening. But let's not get trapped in our social roles. Okay. It's a good exercise. Now the reason that um, my life may be useful, although from most other standpoints it seems, even to me, quite trivial, <laughs> is uh, that I have a... Um, he led three lives. <laughs> I um, have three chapters, each of which is uh, led quite naturally into the next, although at the time it didn't seem very natural. The first chapter was that of being a social scientist. The second was that of being a explorer in the psychedelic community. And the third is that of being a student of Ashtanga Yoga. And I'm going to take you through my trip to show you why each of those transformations occurred as best as I can. In 1961, in the fall of 61, uh, I was at the height of my academic career. I had obtained my PhD from Stanford in psychology and through a more charm than scholarship, I will admit, I had uh, obtained a uh, assistant professorship at Harvard and um, a number of research grants and a role as a therapist at the health service and at the time I had research contracts at Yale and Stanford and I was on leave from Harvard and teaching at the University of California at Berkeley. So I had four major universities cornered and in the academic ladder that's climbing pretty fast. I was 28.
and I was being groomed for all kinds of things. Right? I was definitely on my way up. Now, um, as a result of working these 70 hours a week, I was amassing a lot of money. And I was using this money to live as a cosmopolite or a bachelor under these circumstances. Mine, I had an apartment filled with antiques and a Mercedes Benz and a Cessna airplane and a Triumph motorcycle and a MG sports car and a sailboat. And I went to the Caribbean skin diving and I, you know, that kind of life. And I. I was an empire builder, very simply. That's the best way I'd label myself. Well, uh, with it all, although it looked awfully good on paper, there was something wrong inside about it. I don't think I'm yet ready to be able to label, because I'm probably not free enough to be able to have objective understanding of it to be able to label what really didn't feel right. I can give you some clues about what didn't feel right. One of the problems was I was teaching these very um, hip courses at Harvard. I was teaching Freud and human motivation, personality development, and clinical psychology. And all of these students would come seeking my wisdom. And the problem was that I knew I didn't know. I mean, I knew everything you had to know in order to be a professor of psychology at Harvard. But when you got down to the nitty gritty of what had something to do with people's lives, I knew that it all didn't add up right because I had these various roles. I was a researcher studying child development. And so I could see how the variables we were working with didn't quite get to what that kid was all about. Then I was a therapist and so many hours a week I had somebody sitting on the other side of the desk and he was playing patient, I was playing doctor and I would sit and I run through my list of theories as he would run through his list of symptoms and we'd compare them and match them up and you know it wasn't enough it wasn't it didn't quite gel it didn't quite gel it was as if psychology had a reason to be as defensive as it was <laughs> because as if behaviorism hadn't quite gotten hold of the critical variables in human in the human experience and I looked around, I looked at my colleagues, my psychological and psychiatric colleagues, and they seemed to be really just about as neurotic as anybody else. And they would come and they would be psychologists from nine to five, and then they would go home, and they seemed to be roughly as hung up in their marriages. Their children seemed to be as destructive as other people's children. Um, they seem to show the same personality manifestations. And it seemed a fair question that if all of these theories were so good and these people were the masters of them, why wasn't it reflected in their own human behavior? Now I had gone, I had really tried, I had gone through five years of psychoanalysis and most people hide behind that and say, well, it was a didactic analysis. That is, I did it so that I could help others. Uh, it's a teaching thing. I didn't do it. I did it because I was neurotic and I paid because I was sick and I wanted to get well because I knew that I wasn't making it in the world the right way, even though all the credits were, you know, the byline had all the credits. But at the end of five years of psychoanalysis, it was apparent that since I knew a lot about Freud and could keep pointing out to my analysts where he was making misinterpretations on the basis of a 1906 paper or something like that, that my defenses were at least as strong as his tools. That's all we, that's, that's all that, that roughly $25,000 demonstrated to me. <laughs> Uh, 
I hope those of you that are invested in those particular professional roles will appreciate that I'm probably still merely acting out my uh, negative transference. <laughs> And as far as the other things in my life, if you take the motorcycle, when I first got the motorcycle, I loved to climb hills with a motorcycle and do hill climbing races and things. And go roaring off into the night in the California hills at 95 miles an hour with a girl holding onto the back and the wind blowing and holding on for dear life. And there was a thrill. There was something that was very great. And it would, at the moment, there would be a moment when it would just feel, just that place would feel good inside. But that was about one moment. And then all the rest of the time it was cold, <laughs> you know, or it was rainy. And so after the newness wore off, the motorcycle sat in the garage, and the, the airplane sat out at the landing strip. You know, because after a while, each of the things, the, the possibilities of each of those vehicles for giving me that thing I was looking for inside had been explored. And they were very finite, and I had appreciated what their limits were. Now, it was at this time that, um, just as this, I was settling into um, working for my tenure. <laughs> that is, I was told, if you get your publications in order, we're holding a chair for you. Which meant, you know, publish or perish, get those books out, look good on paper. And so I was doing just that. And although it was a little discouraging to see that it, I already saw that this wasn't going to make it in life, and yet this was my commitment for the next 40 years or so. Now, I had a big corner office at Harvard with two secretaries and about 40 research assistants. And, and uh, as I say, I was an empire builder. And down the hall, in a little closet-like place, there was this other guy who had come back from Italy, who had been riding a bicycle around Italy and had been found by the chairman of the department, who brought him back as the new bright thing for the department, and his name was Timothy Leary. And he was a fun-loving, drinking Irishman. And uh, we were bachelors, and so we started to share evenings together and... Uh, he said he was going to Mexico in the summer, and um, I said that I'd like to come down too, and that um, we ought to fly, take a trip across the north of South America in a little plane, and I told him I flew, which wasn't exactly true, I had a student license at the time. And he said, great, then we would meet in uh, Cuenavaca on a certain date, and we would take off from there. So I then secretly went out and got my license. <laughs> and then nobody would trust me with a plane, so I had to buy one. Uh, the bank bought it, actually. And off I went with the license one day old for this hair-raising trip, believe me, quite hair-raising trip over the mountains into uh, southern Mexico, into central Mexico. Well, when I got there, Tim had just had this experience in which he had taken the um, sacred mushrooms of Mexico, which he had gotten from a woman called Crazy Juana, a corandero up in the hills, who would put one in your hand and two in her mouth. <laughs> and... Uh, I heard many stories about what had happened to him in this experience. There weren't any more of the mushrooms around, and we didn't take the trip across South America. We just hung out down in Tepetzlan and Cuernavaca. 
And then we flew back to the United States together in the plane, which, his son and an iguana. And uh, I went to Berkeley, so I couldn't do anything more. And he went back to Harvard to start exploring these chemicals because he said he had learned more in this one experience than he had in all of his years as a psychologist. So when I came back to Harvard in the spring, I was quite eager to have this experience. And he had gotten hold of the synthetic of these called psilocybin. So on March 6th in 1961, it was the night of a, the biggest snowstorm of the year, and my parents' home was about uh, two blocks away from Tim's big house. And I went to my parents to visit, and then I trudged through the snow and went over to Tim's house to turn on, which we did in the kitchen with a variety of assorted people in our usual highly controlled manner. <laughs> <laughs> and the first part of the experience had that certain unpredictability about it that uh, uh, Tim's son's dog had been out running in the snow and came in and in our timeless minds it seemed like it was gasping for breath too long and we thought it was going to die. Mm -hmm. And it was by then 12 o'clock midnight Saturday night in a raging blizzard and we imagined ourselves carrying this dog to the veterinarian four miles away uh, when we weren't even sure the dog it wasn't just us. So we called his son down from upstairs to ask him to see how he would act with the dog. And he came down, the dog played with him, so we assumed everything was all right. And then I went off into the other room, and I was sitting in the living room by myself after all of this tragic, comic, hallucinatory revelry. I was sitting in the semi-darkness. The light came in from the street. Uh, it was snowing, and it was very beautiful. And I was sitting there, and suddenly in the dark across the room, I saw a figure standing there. And as I looked more closely, I realized that the figure was myself. Uh, it was dressed in a cap and gown, strangely enough. And I, what I saw was my professor-ness across the room. It was a, what you'd call in psychology, what I called at that time, a dissociative experience. <laughs> and so I looked at this professor-ness, <laughs> and I said, well, and I, it wasn't me any longer. I mean, I was here and there was it. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I don't really need that anymore. And I sat back and relaxed. And the minute I said, I don't need that anymore, the, pig, the, the figure changed and it was somebody else. And I sat forward and there I was again, except now I was um, the young cosmopolite. My cosmopoliteness <laughs> was sitting over there. All right, well, I guess I can do without that. Sat back. And in a sequence went by all of my social roles loverness, <laughs> uh, wise man, kind person, all of my roles. And each one, okay, well, too bad about that one. There it goes. And then went by Richard Alpertness. Now, this was another matter, you see. This was, <laughs> this was who I learned to be way back then. And I wasn't at all sure I was, what happened when you gave that up? And I went through my mind the thought, what have I taken with this drug this madman Leary has given me? <laughs> see, it's already his fault. <laughs> <laughs> And what's clearly going to happen now is that I'm going to be an amnesia case because I'm losing my identity. I won't know who I am. All right, well, I can always get another social identity. I went through this thought process. I'll give up Richard Alpertness. At least I have my body. <laughs> 
but as those of you that have experimented in this world know, I had spoken prematurely. Because as I looked down at the couch, nothing below my knees was visible any longer. And as I watched slowly, it all disappeared until it was only the couch on which I was sitting. Now, the kind of panic I experienced at that time is uh, has been reported, in, usually in the tabloids, as the dire consequences of irresponsible use of psychedelic chemicals. <laughs> because there was nothing in my model of the universe that led me to believe that if I was not in my body, there would be anything left. Um, so as far as I was concerned, I was dying or ceasing to exist. That was it. And I recall the feeling. I recall the adrenaline flowing. I recall the sweat breaking out. I recall wanting to scream out for help. I recall all those feelings. And as the panic was mounting in whatever it is that <laughs> it was mounting in, since I wasn't <laughs> seeing anything, obviously, um, a voice inside of me said very quietly and uh, rather jocularly, it seemed to me, in view of the gravity of the situation, um, but who's minding the store? Right? And I became aware at that moment that Although everything by which I knew myself was gone, still there was something in me that was watching this whole process disappear. There was what I at the time was call, calling a scanning device or a point of awareness, something in there that had no reference to body, no reference to personality, no reference to any of my social roles. And yet there it was, clear and lucid and watching the whole thing and just, you know, watching it all happen. And the minute I defined it or labeled it or named it, I experienced a tremendous exhilaration, a tremendous feeling of liberation. And I remember jumping up and I ran out of the snow and danced in the snow. And then later I recall going back through the drifts to my parents' home around five in the morning and deciding as a young tribal buck that I would shovel the snow in the front. And I was shoveling and my parents came to the window and opened the window and said, you damned idiot, come in, you don't shovel snow in the middle of the night. <laughs> And I looked up and I heard this voice, which was the kind of voice of external sanction to which I had always responded, since that's how I got to be where I was. And I listened to the voice inside, and the voice inside says, it's cool if you want to shovel snow, it's all right, nothing immoral about that, it's all right. And I looked up at them, and I smiled, and I danced a bit of a jig, and I went back to shoveling. <laughs> and the window closed, and I saw them smiling behind it. <laughs> well, um, now I was presented with a peculiar dilemma. Because the next Monday, when I had to get up and give my lectures in human motivation, <laughs> The theory of ego psychology, which I was expected to present as a responsible member of the psychological community, I saw was not adequate to the experience that I had had. Because that place that I had gone to, I couldn't find it in the book. I couldn't find it in the book anywhere. Freud's unconscious was too, had too much to do with the uniqueness of the individual and too much to do with personality qualities. Even Jung's collective unconscious wasn't quite the place, as I later explored more carefully. And I couldn't find the words to tell anybody about what had happened. 
and I hid behind what we all got to use quite frequently. Of, this was an ineffable experience. Right? <laughs> I'd like to tell you about it, but it's ineffable. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>